Corporate shows are easy, right? It's just someone talking on a podium, maybe some walking music and video playback. What else is there to it? Just a couple of faders and make it happen. This couldn't be farther from the truth. Although bands are a lot of fun and have their own set of challenges, corporate shows can oftentimes be even more complicated. You've got someone presenting from Zoom, you've got mixed minuses, there's a broadcast going out, got to make sure the room sounds good, got to be able to preview stuff without making the room get interrupted. There's, it's pretty complex when you're un, in the line of fire. So today I want to share you my exact template that I use on the X32 in every corporate show I do. It has a lot of thought and small changes behind workflow that I've been able to refine over hundreds of shows in this seat. I've been able to do shows for the President of the United States, CEOs of the world's largest companies, and some of Silicon Valley's most exciting startups. So I want to share with you everything I know in this one template that's available to you for free in my audio toolkit. You can get that at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. It's got a ton of other great stuff in there. My audio mass survival spreadsheet, my nine EQ pivot points guide, but you definitely want to grab this console file, especially if you're a road dog. And now that COVID has turned everything upside down, you're probably gonna have to take on some corporate shows. So I'm going to give you all my secrets away on exactly why I set up my show file template this way on x 2 Let's jump right in. All right, so here we are in M32 edit. This is my corporate console file template. I'm going to assume you're pretty comfortable with the X32 or M32 itself. This is not a tutorial on how to operate that console, but showing you how I bring my corporate show workflow to this desk. All right, so we're gonna start with outputs, then work back to inputs, and that will give us some context. So you have 16 buses in the X32, and I use the first uh, eight of them as subgroups. So I've got lav PA, so any lavalier microphone would be sent here post fader to this bus, and then the handhelds, podium, and do a MM, which I call mix minuses. So these are sources like Zoom or anything from vMix or any other thing that's a, like a VidCon source I put right here. Media PA, this is any playback. So video playback or any um, sources that I'm using for audio playback like Spotify or QLab to do anything is set here, all post fader. Um, and this is band PA. So this is if I had someone singing the national anthem or someone doing a small acoustic set in between corporate presentations, this is where they would be sent. So all these discrete types of sources uh, do not hit my left, right directly to get sent to these subgroups first. And then as you can see here on the lot, lot of PA, I go to conf uh, channel and I'm able to make sure it goes to the main out. They're also sent to the mono or center, but I don't use it uh, for an a semi ox sub. I use it as a way to collect all my inputs and then have as a mono send I can send back into smart so I can monitor that from my console. So I can have RTA, uh, single channel, or I can have a dual channel transfer function comparing a reference mic in the room to my actual console file mix. So that's how I get stuff back into smart. Uh, bus number nine is full back one and full back two. So those are two separate monitor mixes. Oftentimes you wanna have uh, one of these on stage uh, right in front of your onstage talent. If there's a Q&A session, session and you have handhelds being passed around the room from Q&A, you'll wanna make sure and send those microphones to that wedge or that full back. And that might be, before, be for the presenter to hear that. And they'll have full back two. If I have someone in a band, just a solo acoustic guitar player or something, that is set up for them. So I have two separate sends ready to go for that. And you'll wanna send everything to full back one for the presenter post fader. So you're not having to worry about muting Q&A microphones all the time. So when you bring them up in the house, it brings them up in the wedge. Uh, but for fullback two in a traditional band setting, they usually want a pretty stable monitor mix and they just want to hear themselves. So I'll do everything to that pre-fader and go there. Bus 11 is my zoom mix minus and then zoom mix minus. So one and two for each of these respective bu buses. So if I have two machines on zoom or whatever Skype video conference software, I'm going to get audio in from them and that will come into one of my input channels, but I need to send them audio back. But if I'm getting something in from them, I can't just send them straight program or left, right. Cause then they'll hear themselves back again. So mix minus, if I were to do, um, sends on fader here, I'll select this bus. I go to my inputs it's getting everything except themselves. And I can choose to send them walking music or not or whatever. And I also have a separate bus for talkback if I needed to talk to them. So I have my talkback microphone uh, routed there. Uh, you have a talkback A and B. A usually goes to the house. Then I have B that's routed to these Zoom mix minuses. So I can say like, hey, you're gonna be up in 10 seconds. They can hear me 
and then um, I have a separate way to communicate with them. So I have two separate Zoom inputs. And then uh, bus 13 is my Dugan Trigger bus. We're going to come back to that one, but it's an auto mixer on the X32. Dan Dugan's patent has expired, so everyone can use his algorithm. This is more or less the Dugan as popularized on Yamaha consoles and now others. This is my vocal effects bus. So uh, if I have someone singing the national anthem, I have a bus ready to go with those inputs sent there. Um, and I have on effects one through four, all get bus 14. Uh, so they can uh, have any effect sent to there. And then they have their normal returns that are coming there. And I have my program bus. This is where basically everything that's going to the house and now plus my NAT microphones and my in-room microphones to give something some wetness are all sent here. And I can apply separate processing to it like this limiter to get it nice and hot to a program volume. Out the gate, I'm usually giving it 11 dB of gain and on the output trim minus one. So that's a net total of 10 dB increase. I go ahead and bring the squeeze, knee and attack um, all the way down. Usually the knees at zero, attack is as fast as it can so I don't get any clipping and releases really quickly at 32 milliseconds. I just want to slap down at any peaks and get out of the way. So those are that bus. Then I have my six matrices, which I usually end up using more like a system processor or DSP. So if I don't have something separate, um, I have my left, right fader, everything goes there for the main mix. And my left, right is sent post fader to all six of these matrices. So I have PA left and right. I have a front fill send. I have a subwoofer send and an off left and right. I'm not a big fan of Oxfed subs. Um, so a matrix lives there and just gets the whole feed. And then I take care of whatever processing to divide out low versus mid and high to the PA on, on that end. So I don't like having two places where it can affect low end. If there's too much low end, use EQ and trust that I did the system tuning on the front end to make it sound right. And the, those go through whatever outputs and away we go. So back to our inputs. So my first four are RF1234. And by default, they are sent to my LAV PA group. Um, and I can apply processing across them. If they're handhelds, I'll flip them over and send them to the handheld PA group. And that's the color coding I like is the light blue for LAV and then red for handheld. But sometimes uh, I work with companies that have color coding on the handhelds and I'll go ahead, change the, the color on the channel to match whatever colors on the microphone. Uh, as far as the actual processing on them, all I have set is the high pass filter. Uh, most often I find myself cutting around 400 or so um, with that EQ. I have a compressor set three to one ratio, no makeup gain, three millisecond attack for speech. Uh, sometimes I go as fast as one. So one, three or 10 is what I end up doing. Uh, the release is also very fast too. I don't want stuff getting squashed. No syllables getting brought down for a while. I want to do its thing and get out of the way. So very uh, fairly fast attack and really fast release is what's going on here. You can see on the, the bus sends, it's being sent to the LAV PA group um, and no, uh, program. So nowhere else at the moment. Uh, if I knew that this microphone was going to be used for q and I would go ahead and send it to fullback one for so they could hear audience questions. So that's the same across all these RF channels. So I just got to make a decision at the top. Do I got two lofts, two handhelds, one loft, three handhelds, or all four handhelds? Any of them are viable. This is open here for a podium. Uh, so this podium microphone sent to my podium PA subgroup and that subgroup sent to the mains. And if I go over here to my effects slots five through eight, you can see I have the de -er inserted on each of these four groups that would have dialogue to them. And so bus one, bus two, three, and four all have the de -er, uh, on a setting of 10. Uh, and that way I'm not having to do it on individual channels. It's I'm not usually to have enough time or brain space to think about uh, being able to dial in a de -er on a per channel basis. So just all everything that's going to that subgroup is going to hit that de -er and then go out uh, to the house. The only downside is since I cannot send a group, uh, a bus to a bus on the X32, my program audio doesn't get that DSing. And so that's just a place I've chosen to lose uh, to get uh, some extra inserts available to me for other use cases. And so just a refresher on those four buses, it's Lav PA, Handheld PA, Podium PA, and Mix Minus. So that means any spoken word input is going to hit a DSer. And then I have a podium spare, almost always, if I, I got it on the truck, I will run two podiums and I have a neat little 3D printed little clip that has them clipped right together, which is super handy. The second one's always muted and I bring both faders up together and then I can, un and just with 
one stroke, use two fingers to hit it and pop over if I lose that first one. Channel seven is a spare 58 coiled up downstage center with uh, 25 feet of slack on it. So at any point I lose RF, I lose the podium, I can reach under the stage, I have an RF, uh, that microphone there and available as a spare. This is stolen from band world. This is not uncommon to have for your golden channel or your lead vocalists. So that's what's going on there. Uh, then I have my eighth channel, which is my Dugan trigger. Okay. So on the X32, unfortunately, the auto mixer can only work on the first eight channels. And that you can see here with these labeled X. What that does is it has all these inputs uh, share gain effectively. And so if any one of them is up and the algorithm detects that it's the loudest and most prominent, it's going to give that gain or prominence to that channel. Uh, it's not quite a gate, but some people like to think of it as a smart gate that's only letting through out of those eight channels what's strongest. And so this is not for two vocalists harmonizing with each other because we want their full gain represented there. But this is for dialogue, great for back and forth. So it's phenomenal. If you have eight lavs on a panel, you could throw them all in this group. So since you only have eight channels, and if you have more inputs than that, you can get creative with it. So I have channel eight. If I go up to the channel setting or config, its source is bus 13. And bus 13 is right here. And if I do sends on fader, let's look on what's sent to it. So what's sent to it is both of my zooms and my playbacks. And so that's A, B, X, and Y. This is the common nomenclature for A and B for graphics machines, X and Y for video playback machines. Uh, those are sent to that bus. And what that means is if I have a podium up and someone's conversing and then, hey, we got Dan on Zoom is here and he's looking at a 90 inch TV in the back talking to Zoom. And then that person talks on Zoom, that's being sent as well as to the house as the Dugan trigger. And since all eight of those channels are weighing the gain against themselves, the Dugan trigger is going to outweigh any ambient information going to the podium microphone and it's going to take over. So now Zoom has prominence and that assures me that I'm not, not going to get the Zoom going back into the NAT microphones or the podium microphone coming back and getting a feedback loop. So I have any playback source of Zoom and then any video rolls. So this helps me do that as well because... Um, Sometimes you're juggling a whole lot of inputs when you come to a video roll. Uh, you don't want to mess around with the mute group or bringing all of them down. And so if I have playback X rolling nice and hot and it's also being sent to this Dugan trigger, it's going to automatically duck all of those previous seven inputs. Um, the downside is if you have more RF than just seven or more spoken word channels than just seven, uh, you're going to have to either uh, put them somewhere else or lose the Dugan trigger functionality. But I think it's really handy. I started doing this this year and I've loved it. It's a lot easier to do on a console that has the Dugan built in. You could just simply set up that bus and send it to one of the 16 channels. But on the X32, this is my workaround to make that happen. So I talked about this is a, just another input for a Zoom machine, Zoom 1, Zoom 2. Uh, I have AB, usually the graphics audio inputs, then X and Y are the uh, video playback inputs. And then these are my two band channels. And you can see here, I've got the leisure compressor inserted. That's my favorite vocal compressor. Uh, sometimes I'll do the Ultimo, the 1176, but I like this one for vocals most of the time. And then band instrument one and two. So if I got a duo that's, you know, uh, a girl and a guy singing and one's playing acoustic, one plays mandolin, this is ready to go uh, all right there. And then I can choose to send them to either one of the fullbacks. If I don't have any CUNY microphones, I can have one fullback for the guy, one fullback for the girl, um, or if they're having a share monitor, whatever. And so this is all there allocated and ready to go. The rest of my inputs uh, here, I have blank, just if I have a bigger band. And I have a few inputs blank here in front of Zoom, just in case I have more um, RF added, but I try to squeeze as much as I can that's useful to me in these first 16. Um, and then I have the band on the next 16. So I just move down a layer for the band segment and then go back to the top for any transitions. I of course could put these on DCAs as well if I wanted to. So go here. I got my NAT microphones and those are at Unity. Make sure and unassign those from your main stereo bus because you don't want your, your NAT microphones. And what I mean by these, these are the ambient microphones in the room because we've all listened to some program recordings of a show that, you know, so they're giving out awards and people erupting with, with clapping and you're seeing that in the room on the camera shot, but you're not hearing it. You're just hearing one open microphone on the stage. And it just sounds dead and dry. So NAT microphones, there's placing a pair of microphones phones, usually one or two spots. It's usually, you've got two screens at Y in the room. 
Um, you're able to place them under the screens, pan hard left and right. Or recently, I've been like placing an XY pair at the back of the room, uh, right where camera one is. Since that's the primary shot that's looking at the stage, your microphones are listening as if you were at camera one. You just got to watch out for any noisy comm or chatter from that camera platform. Um, so anyway, so those NAT microphones, just high passing them, sending them straight to my program bus only, not my main, and then I can adjust them accordingly. Which brings me to the DCAs. I've got Tunes, QLab, and iPod, which are, are my aux inputs. An X32, you can flip these over to pick off the card input, which is pretty cool, or just use the uh, quarter inch ends on the back. So tunes left and right is almost always Spotify that's playing at all times through a looping playlist. QLab is for any specific cues or moments in the in in the show so qlab is a great software uh to do that um i i lately i've been using farago uh but either one works so if someone has a very specific bumper music or uh the actual musical talent is someone singing over a track i'll have a separate machine there into that input so i can always get to walk in music whenever i can if there is a break um between segments or something goes wrong, it's, it's always there, always on. And then the specific moments are in that Q lab. And then I always have on iPod left, right, another just eighth inch cable hanging out just in case the client walks in I'm like, hey, can you play this song? It's only on title <laughs> for whatever reason. And I need to play it right now. I can quickly just have them plug in their phone or plug in their iPod and get playback uh, from front of house no matter where they're at. While we're here on the auxes and returns, these are just the effects returns for anything in the vocal effects. So I just got a haul, a plate, and a couple of delays. If I don't have any singing or musical talent, uh, I'll often flip these effects over to be the combinator, uh, which is pretty cool. So I can have this as a multiband processor and get more fancy with uh, leveling out uh, the podium microphone or someone who has a very dynamic voice on a handheld. So that's what I will do if I do not have musical talent. So when I'm in show, what this looks like in front of me is usually the first, first 16 channels, as you see here, and then these eight DCAs. So I can always bring up walk-in music whenever I can, any audio cue that's specific, or any of like the client front of house music that needed to plug in last minute. Uh, the vocal delay amount, so this is DCA tied to that, so I can do any delays. And then I have my nap mics here on DCA 8, and I will duck these during any video roll so we're not hearing people clinking forks and chattering when we're playing a video. Uh, I wish I could also have these on a Dukin trigger, but we only got eight inputs, so that's why I've chosen to leave out of that. All right, that was a quick walkthrough through my corporate console file. It you know it feels simple just to collect all these sources, make sure they're sent the right places, but there's a lot of little functionality I hope that was helpful to you. Again, you can snag that for free at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. Uh, just, you'll get an email with a, a link to a page that has a bunch of resources, and it'll be there in big bold letters, corporate console file template. You can go grab that. This works on the X32 or M32. Um, what I want you to let me know below is what other corporate show hacks do you have in your template? What am I missing? So what is a really cool piece of your workflow that I need to know about? Let me know below. I'm Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for watching. I love making things sound good. I love getting to share this with you. I'll catch you next time.